Good evening. Welcome. <clears throat> Tonight, I'm going to just, I won't keep you too long, but I wanted to talk about uh, hunger and thirst and in the context of faith, because we're going to begin, I'm going to begin to do some teaching on faith. Hey, Adam, God bless you, brother. I'm going to do some teachings on faith and uh, a lot on faith and what 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 the uh, substance of our faith is and what God uh, wants us to believe him for uh, but I was thinking about uh, the importance of hunger and actually I was laying in bed and I either right when I woke up or right before I went to sleep I actually saw myself preaching on hunger and thirst and it, it was ministering to me while I was having this mind vision if you want to call it that and, and I recognized that really what God has been doing in me has been bringing me into a place of a kind of hunger that I don't even think I can, I can tell you. It's, I've, I'm more hungry for God now than I've ever been in my entire life. And uh, I also recognized how that my hunger grew dormant, my thirst grew dormant over the last several years. Uh, I was a pastor, I was doing ministry, but the ministry became laborious. It, it became almost, uh, I was going through the motions in a sense. And I had lost my, my spiritual hunger. I was in a kind of mode where I was just existing. And uh, in the last six months, and especially in the last couple months, three months, four months, uh, God has renewed my hunger in a way that I can't even tell you. Uh, and I can recognize how this process uh, went and and I want to share that with you and I also want to uh, help you to stir you up to get hungry for God because one of the things I know for certain is that no kind of spiritual breakthrough can come to your life to my life until we're hungry and God has a habit before he brings us into new seasons of of greater spiritual spiritual fruitfulness and depth before we can break through into those those deeper levels of faith and and progress in, in our Christian life, he always brings the church into a place of hunger. Uh, a, a sort of dissatisfaction has to come first. Now, don't, com don't confuse what I'm saying because the Bible also says that godliness with contentment is great gain. It's a good thing to be content with what you have, not to be covetous and not to be unthankful or un uh, grumbling. We don't want that. But <clears throat> I'm talking about while we're thankful for what God has done, we're thankful for what God is doing, we also have a deep yearning for more, a deep yearning to go beyond where we are now, to see more fruit, to see more progress, to see more results. Uh, the Lord said that by our bearing fruit, the, the Father would receive glory. So in God's mind, He wants us to bear much fruit uh, by abiding in Him and demonstrating His life to the world. <clears throat> so... There has to be deep within our hearts a spiritual yearning, a spiritual hunger, a passion. And so sometimes God will bring us into a season where we become discontent in a sense, spiritually. We recognize there's more. And if you're not in that place, I would suggest getting there as fast as you can. And I, I can give you a couple of, of tips on how to get yourself spiritually hungry again. God wants you to, 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 to have the maximum fruit, the maximum potential to bear as much fruit as you possibly can in this life. We were put here on this earth not to enjoy our life, not to pass through and, and make as many friends or you know whatever as we can. The, the sole purpose for our existence on this earth is to bear fruit for Jesus Christ. It is to, to do the work that God put us here to do. Everything else is secondary, far secondary to that one purpose that we were put here for. The, uh, the, the problem is we get so busy with making ends meet and doing whatever it is that we do every day, all day, all week, that we lose sight, I think, of the main thing that we were put on this earth for. And so we have to get ourselves into the right frame of mind. And really that's what I talk, when I'm talking about being hungry and thirsting after God, it's about putting ourselves in the right frame of mind to receive from God. Um, nobody eats when they're full. If, if, you're, if you just had a stack of pancakes and you're full, if I start talking to you about food or if I invite you to come have a bite to eat, you're not that excited about it. And sometimes as a preacher, 
when you're preaching to people that are already full, in other words, they're already content where they are, they don't recognize their need for more of God, it, it's like it's like carrying a couch on your shoulder up a, up a set of stairs. Preaching to people that aren't hungry is, is, if you're a preacher, you know what I'm talking about. I've preached hundreds, if not thousands of sermons all over the world, different continent states to different age groups. And I can tell you, when you're in front of a group of hungry people, who want more of God, recognize there is more of God, you can feel it. You can sense it. When you're preaching, it pulls the anointing of God right out of your spirit because they're hungry, and the hungry are the ones that get filled. When you're preaching to a people that are just, you know, kind of lazy, lukewarm, content, it's so difficult. It's it's laborious. It's it's a challenge. It's a, it's it's frustrating oftentimes. So when, when we're already in a place where we feel like we've got what we need, we have arrived, we're content, we're never going to be able to go on with God. So before God can bring us into the more, into more fruitfulness, to more breakthrough, He has to bring us into a, a frame of mind where we recognize our need. Now if you've followed me for any a number of years or months, you, you've probably heard me quote Revelations 3. I think anybody that's heard me preach a number of times has heard me quote Revelation 3 because it's it's something that I, I at least reference often. But I, I want to reference it again tonight, but just quickly because I want to make a, a point about it maybe that you haven't ever heard. And uh, it's, you know, the lukewarm passage. And you, you have seven letters that Jesus wrote to seven churches. And the last church that he wrote the letter to, Laodicea, he wrote this to them, I wish that you were cold or hot. He said, because you are are not cold or hot, but you're lukewarm. He said, I'm going to vomit you or spit you out of my mouth. So Jesus said to Christians, I want you to be either cold or hot. Either get in the game, get on fire, be be full of zeal, or just go. Just you're, 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 you're lingering, you're sitting on the fence, you're compromised, you're not doing anything maybe overly evil, but you're not doing anything overly good, you're stagnant. There's just no place in the purpose of God for stagnancy, for lukewarmness. And so Jesus is encouraging the church to come on, get on fire, get in the game, so to speak. Get serious about about Him, Jesus. And, and then He says this to them. He said, you say you are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. But I say you're poor, miserable, blind, wretched, and naked. So you see here, you got two different opinions, two different perspectives. Jesus' perspective of the church is that they're poor, miserable, blind, wretched, and naked. You can't even, I can't even think of words that are more, I mean, just horrible than poor, miserable, blind, wretched, naked. The problem is that the church, though, doesn't see themselves in that light. They see themselves as rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing, no needs. So you can see right out, right out of the gate, there's a problem with the framework in the mind. The way they see themselves and the way Jesus sees them is totally different. I mean, it's amazing that somebody miserable and wretched and naked can see themselves as rich and have need of nothing. But it's the deception of this age that we live in, especially us North Americans. We live in an age where everything is lying to us. Society is lying to us. The news, they're lying to you. The entertainment industry is lying to you. Unfortunately, many preachers are lying to you. Everything in this life is saying, calm down, enjoy yourself, don't get too excited, or hunker down and be afraid, or there's a number of just, just, it's all, if you don't take care of yourself, nobody else will. It's all about you. It's all about this. It's all about that. There's just so much in this world lying to us to get our mind off of the thing that really we were put here for, which is to glorify God with all that we have and all that we are, to do the work that Jesus Christ himself began, which is the work of saving sinners. Jesus adamantly said, I did not come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners to repentance. That's the work of Christ. I came to call sinners to repentance. Paul said, Jesus Christ came to save sinners of whom I'm chief. So the underlying perspective point, the reason for Jesus coming on this earth was to save sinners. That is the main thing, the main theme of the gospel. Now, everything in our life, in our society, tells us that it's all about anything other than saving sinners. And so we get bogged down, we get overloaded with stuff and things. And we go to church and throw it in, so, you know, it's... 
It's a part of our life, but it's not the very essence of our life, the things of God. So we can get into a frame of mind where we think we're doing pretty good when in Jesus' mind we're doing poor, miserable, blind, wretched, and naked. So in order for us to get into a place where we really can break through and have more of God, have more fruit, we first have to recognize our need. The lukewarm, the, the one of the most amazing characteristics of being lukewarm is that you can't discern your own spiritual condition. You say you're rich, I say you're poor. You say you're, you had no needs, I say you don't have anything. So Jesus says one thing, the lukewarm says something else. Their perspective is off. So God is trying to bring our perspective into his perspective. And so we have to be able to gauge ourselves by what the word of God teaches. And I think the only way that we can have a, a life of fruitfulness and to actually do the work that God created us to do is to have the right perspective. So I'm going to start there. What is the right perspective? What did God call us to? Now, obviously we know Jesus came to save, save sinners. I just quoted the verse. Paul said it. Jesus said it. He came to save sinners. He came to preach the word of God, the message of God, the gospel, so that sinners would hear, believe, and repent. Now, we are joining in to that work. We're, we're not here to do our own thing. We're not here to blaze a new trail. We're not here to do something new. We're here to build upon the ministry of Jesus Christ, which is to say we need to do the very works that Jesus Christ did. Now, it, this is where we're, the rubber is going to meet the road. I'm going to start teaching on faith. I'm going to start teaching on a number of things dealing with faith. But if you don't get this part, if you don't agree with me here, then you're, I'm going to aggravate you to no end. The work that Jesus Christ set out for us to accomplish was began through his personal life and ministry. I, I love Acts 10, 38. Jesus Christ, a man anointed of God who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. God was with Jesus Christ, so Jesus Christ went about in the anointing of the Holy Ghost doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. First John, John said in First John 3 that, that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. So Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, to do good, to heal all who were oppressed of the devil, to preach the gospel of the kingdom. He was anointed in Luke 4, it says, to preach, to heal, to deliver, to, to set the captives free. Okay, that's his identity. Now, he calls the church in, that's us, to share in the ministry or the work that he gave us. Now, I want to read to you out of Mark chapter 16. I, I could quote this to you, but I think it's important that I read it right to you. And then I'm going to cross-reference you over to John 14, because these are two specific passages that I think will help us to get our mind in line or in tune with what God says. And then once we see where, where we lack, you see the lukewarm church doesn't recognize their need. They think they're okay, they're good, they're rich. So they can't go forward. They can't progress in God because they don't see their need. They, in other words, they're not hungry. They're content. They're settled. They have it all. So you can't bring them into a, a better place. If you look in history, when God wanted to do a move any time in history, he brought a group of people into a kind of spiritual discontentment. So they would see there's more. We're lacking something. We need God. We need to, we need to, to, to really figure out why we're lacking what God said we should have. And they start praying and fasting and seeking and revival would come and entire nations would be touched by the power of God because a few would get, would get serious about what God said. I think revival is here. Revival is ready to be released in America. Uh, I'm not buying this that God can't do anything in America because we're too sinful. I'm not buying into that. God wants to pour out his spirit in America and Africa, everywhere, in every nation and every continent. He's looking for people, though, who will get in line with his mind. So by reading what Jesus says we ought to be doing, it will help us to recognize where we're missing it. And then hopefully when we realize we're not doing what Jesus Christ said we should be doing. In other words, I'm not measuring up to what Christ says I should measure up to. Hopefully that will instill a discontentment of a kind, a spiritual hunger of a kind that will cause us to begin to ask the hard questions. Why not? Why am I coming up short? Why is God not doing in me and through me what he said he wanted to do? And once we begin to question that and hunger for that, we'll begin to fast. We'll begin to pray. We'll begin to press into the word. We'll begin to 
to really do whatever is necessary to get in the frame of mind where we can begin to receive from God. In other words, God wants to send revival to us right now. God wants to pour out his spirit right now. He's waiting on our hearts and minds to come into alignment with his word and get hungry. Remember, Matthew 5, 6, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Only the hungry and the thirsty get filled. So I think if anything, the devil is trying to make us in, into a place where we're full, where we don't have hunger, where we don't have passion. We get so overburdened and overloaded with life that we're not hungry and thirsty as we ought to be. Therefore, we cannot be filled. We're stagnant. So look at what Mark 16 teaches. Now, some some don't don't believe this is for today, so I, I guess this is where we've got to decide if we believe the, the whole Bible or we believe parts of the Bible. I believe the whole Bible is for today. It's to be experienced, it's to be obeyed and apprehended. Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. First and foremost, we're to go and preach the gospel to every creature, every single creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, I wonder how much our minds are in tune with that one statement. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now, when we know baptism is not just dunking somebody underwater. It includes that. But baptism, according to Romans 6, is when we are buried with Christ in death. In baptism, and then we're raised by the Spirit of God to new life. That is to say we repent, we turn from sin, we commit ourselves, we consecrate ourselves to the ministry of the Spirit. Go into all the world and preach, and, the, and this is what will happen. Whoever believes and is baptized, in other words, whoever turns from their sin, as Jesus said in Mark, the first part of Mark, he said, repent and believe the gospel. The time is, is at hand. Repent, therefore, and believe the gospel. Repentance and believing, repentance and faith is, is where we receive the kingdom of God into our bodies through the Holy Spirit, into our spirits. Now, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that not, does not believe shall be damned. Our, I know we agree with this theologically, but I don't think this message or this reality has the effect or the impact in our minds and in our spirits that it ought to, so that it actually is the is the is the mode of being that we live by, that we see all men all over the place around us as sinners lost, as people damned to hell eternally without God. And the only solution or remedy to their problem is inside of us. We are carriers of the very life of Jesus Christ. We are not passing on information about God. We are actually representatives, ambassadors of the very life of Christ. We are containers, carriers of the very reality that sets men free from sin. Our job is to transmute, translate, transpose that life from within, out of our mouth, and into their heart by the Holy Ghost. We are called to this ministry. It should be the very essence of our being. It should be the thing that makes us beat, a move, excited in life, is saving sinners from hell because that's Jesus' ministry. So this is the simple message. I mean, it's obviously it's much more complex if we get into the theolo theological you know, things, but the simple message is this. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. It's, it's eternal, it's forever, and it's that serious. It's life or death. Now, for many, we have stopped right there at verse 16. And we haven't gone on. Because the next part of this is where really the rubber meets the road. You know, It's easy to stop there because so far, whatever he's called us to, can be done in your own strength. And in other words, there's nothing necessarily supernatural about what he just said for you to go do. Preaching is not, if you're going to preach in the anointing and the unction of the Holy Ghost, it's a, it is supernatural. But plenty of people are out preaching and they're not doing it in the supernatural. They're just communicating. They're passing on information. Unfortunately, we have a whole bunch of preachers. That's all, all they do is pass on information. It's all head knowledge. It's just information being passed from one head to another. It doesn't produce spiritual results because it's only intellectual. The Bible says that the natural mind cannot receive the things of the Spirit because they're foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. So there is an intellectual kind of passing on of information, communication that's not in the Spirit. And it's just, it's just head knowledge. But the kind of 
preaching God's calling us to is supernatural preaching. It's supernatural because it must include more than just head knowledge being passed on through words. And that's where verse 17 comes in, the supernatural. He said, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if, it sh and, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Now, this isn't that we're going to be snake charmers like some have gotten snakes and played with them and then they get bit and died and wonder why. Well, that's because that's foolishness. God's not calling us to be snake charmers. The idea is that if a snake bites us or if poison comes into our bodies, we can be delivered from that. You can see that in the book of Acts. The only example of a snake Anybody handling a snake in the New Testament is Paul handled the snake. Remember, it bit him on his, it fastened upon his hand. He shook that thing off into the fire. So this isn't a call to snake charming. The idea, though, is if you're in the center of God's will, serving him and faithfully in the Holy Ghost, even if a snake, like a viper, who bites and latches onto your hand, you'll just shake that thing off and it'll go in the fire because you are being protected by God, by the Holy Ghost. So... Listen to the, 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 the power in this. These signs shall follow them that believe. They will. They will cast out devils. They will speak with tongues. They will take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they, the sick, shall recover. So he's describing a people who are going first into all the world. Their mind is to preach the gospel their mind says all the world is lost and dead in their sins and I am alive because I have the Spirit of God in me and I, I am the only hope these people have at getting into heaven. So they go with a mandate, a mission, a focus, a determination. It's a mode of being. And in that, they are leaning into God because they're not just going out passing out information about a God far away. They're actually re replicating, reproducing transmitting the very life that's in them, which is God, through their spirit, by their words, and into those who hear. This has to be accompanied with signs, with indications that God is truly with you. And if God had his way, every preacher would be demonstrating the very life of God through power. And God never, I, I mean, I've said this before and in my recent videos I did on the Holy Spirit on YouTube, you can watch them, but I said this before. God never sends any preachers out in the New Testament. And there are numbers of, of, of references and times in which Jesus called the disciples. First he called 12, then he anointed 70 others above the 12. That's 82. And every time he, he calls preachers and sends them out to preach, he says, preach, heal, deliver. You go back to Luke 4. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Jesus said, it's upon me. The spirit of God came upon Jesus, just like the spirit of God is called to be upon us. And he said, because he has anointed me to preach, to heal, and to deliver. So the ministry of Jesus Christ was always preach, heal, deliver. When he sent the disciples out, he didn't say, now just go preach. He said, go preach, go heal, and go deliver. Now, the Great Commission, this thing we've just read here, was his final statement to Christians to go in his name and do the very works that he did. Now, some smart intellectual person in some library or his study somewhere has come up with a couple of loophole scriptures, I still haven't found them, and, and twisted them to take this portion of the Great Commission out by creating some theological excuse for powerlessness so that many believers, many Christians go out, many preachers go out feeling like it's their mandate to preach the gospel, but it's not their mandate to heal, deliver, and cast, cast out demons, heal the sick, and deliver, deliver people, and speak with new tongues. So at what point do we get to distinguish or differentiate or separate the great commission of God down to just preaching or just teaching or just congregating. How, what right do we have to separate the Bible into the compartments that we can do this because we like this, but we're going to make some loophole to say this is done away with because we don't understand it and we don't like it. Well, here's the saga of the church from the beginning of time. When we lack the power of God, 
to do the ministry that Jesus called us to, we have to do one of two things. We have to either get hungry and get thirsty and, and get to a place where we get into the power that God promised us by walking in him, we recognize where we're not, where, where, where we're lacking. This is what, what the lukewarm church needs to do. We need to wake up and question, why am I not walking in that? Why am I not experiencing that? And get our mind in agreement with the word of God, not to excuse, that's the other thing. The second thing you can do, and if you're not willing to pay the price, get in the right framework of mind and press into God. The other uh, option is to just excuse it away and say, well, I don't think we're all supposed to heal the sick. I don't think we're all supposed to cast out demons. I don't believe we're all supposed to speak with new tongues. You have to do one or the other. And see, this is where all the denominations have segregated themselves. This is why we have so many denominations. It's just the denomination, the denominations for the most part have adhered to this idea that we're not to expect God to heal the sick when we pray. We're not to expect demons to be cast out. And we're not to expect to speak with new tongues when we ask for the Holy Spirit. So the denominations have created a loophole. Now, I challenge anybody who's listening to me who has maybe agreed to this, they call it cessationism. I challenge you, go and listen to the doctrine of cessationism, the very, the loophole that, that has been created to exclude the supernatural power from the gospel today. And I mean, the majority, mainstream denominations have come up with a doctrine that's a loophole to basically X this out of the Bible. I would challenge you with an open mind to go and listen to the doctrine. Read, their, read the teaching on it. There's nothing there. It is empty. It's vain. And yet, standing before you in the scripture, just read the book of Acts. The whole thing is supernatural. The number of promises for us to walk in power, healing, deliverance of, from demons, speaking with new tongues, prophesying, and doing the wonderful works that Jesus Christ did. The number of promises in scriptures, pertaining to those things is in the dozens upon dozens upon dozens. There are no scriptures, none that say this is going to be done away with. The scriptures that they use to come up with this doctrine are so mind-bogglingly out of context and minuscule that it's overwhelmingly ridiculous to think that you are called today to walk in any less power than the apostles did, than Jesus Christ did. You have to twist, mutilate, mingle, corrupt, defile the truth of the word of God to come to such a conclusion. And yet, the amazing thing is, believers in their ignorance and their apathy are willing to just buy into stuff that has no scriptural basis. Now, hopefully, you guys who are listening to me, I think most of you that will listen to me or would even continue on from here, believe that the power of God is for today. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are for today. Well, then the question is, why aren't we walking in them like we ought to? There's one answer for this. Obviously, it's a lack of power, but why is there a lack of power? Power comes from faith. Faith is a combination of obedience and confidence in God's word. Faith, when you say faith, don't think I'm just talking about some mental ascent because that's not faith. Faith is actually a lifestyle. The justice says shall live by faith. Faith is something you live by. Faith releases the power of God. I could give you a number of examples. Uh, one of my favorites is the woman with the issue of blood. And she said in her heart, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole of my plague. Now she was already went to spend all of her money on doctors, was none better. She, she trusted in man and man couldn't help her. So she decided that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And if he is the Messiah, then he came to bear our sicknesses and our, and our sins upon his body. She said, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. Now, she, out of that faith, she said in her heart, the Bible says, if, if I do this, I'll be made whole. Well, she acted upon her faith because faith without works is dead. If she just said that but didn't act, then she would have gotten none better. But she acted upon her faith and she touched the hem of his garment. And the, and the very moment, the very second that she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, she was immediately made whole of that plague. Immediately. The most fascinating thing of that story is that Jesus stops and says, who touched me? I felt virtue go out of me. So the point of the story is Jesus healed this woman by his power without even being conscious of it. In other words, her faith puts a demand on the power of God without Jesus even being conscious of it. So it wasn't like Jesus turned and healed her consciously. 
Her faith made the power of God work. It is so today. Faith makes the power of God work. And where there's unbelief, the power of God won't work. You look at Mark 6 and you study and you see that when Jesus went to his hometown, he preached the word there. And, and if you read Luke 4, which is where he said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach, heal, and deliver. He said that in his hometown. In other words, he was declaring openly, publicly, that he was there to heal, deliver, and preach. And yet it said, they questioned and said, isn't this just a carpenter's son? Don't, don't we know his brothers and sisters? Don't we know his parents? And they chose not to believe Jesus' words. And the Bible says, he could there do no mighty works because of their unbelief. Now, it didn't say that he would not do any works because of their unbelief. He said he could not. In other words, their unbelief in his word created a blockade to the power of God being manifest in that city. In other words, Jesus would have healed people. Jesus would have done ma major miracles there, but he could not. He went there with the intention of doing miracles. He went there with the intention of healing and healing the sick and doing all the things he did in every other city he went to, raising dead people, opening blind eyes, opening deaf ears, healing sick folks. He had the same intention, and even more so because he publicly declared that he was there to heal, deliver, and preach. And yet, because of their unbelief, he was blocked. He couldn't do it. Their unbelief limited his ability, and so it is today. If God had his way, he would be pouring out his spirit upon all flesh through us, his body. But we must believe it. Not just believe that Jesus is Lord, not just believe that we're saved, that's where it begins, but believe that Jesus will do the very things that he said he would do when we go and do what he told us to do. Now, this is how we got to read the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and preach, and these signs will follow them that believe. Notice, it's to those who believe. Believe what? Believe that when they act upon God's word, they'll get the results that God promised. I think we're sitting around waiting on an anointing to fall on us before we go do the work. We're supposed to believe now that God is in us. We're born again. If you're not, get born again. Submit yourself to God. Humble yourself. Repent. Get born again. Get converted. And then when Jesus Christ comes in, you get filled with the Holy Ghost. Ask for the Holy Spirit by faith. And when the Spirit of God comes upon you, then you can act on the Word in confidence because God will never let His Word return void. Now, if if we separate or if we if we tear out of our page the the supernatural intentions of God through the Spirit in the church. What are we left with but a book that no longer has the meaning that it once had? In other words, if we get to pick and choose which parts of the Scripture we, we possess and chase after and which parts we don't, then aren't we God? Haven't we become our own gods when we start deciding which parts of the Bible are for today or for us or that we're to go after? Either it's all God's word or none of it is. I don't think we can separate and say some of it's been done away with. It's either all for us or it's not. Why don't people say we're not supposed to preach anymore if they say we're not supposed to heal anymore? How do you break into a passage, separate it in half and say we're still to do this but not to do this? Who gives you the right to do that? Nobody. The very point is we've got to get back to the basics of, go of the gospel. If God commanded us to go and do these works, then we're not doing Jesus' works unless we're doing these works, all of them. So, the lukewarm church excuses it and says, yeah, but I do this well, I give my money, I go to church, I, I'm nice, uh, whatever. Listen, if you compare yourselves with other believers, you'll deceive yourself. If you, you, you might be better than every other Christian in your church. That means nothing to God. God's not going to judge you with every other believer in your church. God doesn't esteem you by who, who, who you're better, uh, uh, better than who you're around. The only thing that God wants to see duplicated in us is the very life of Christ. And until we get honest with ourselves and admit that we're not where we should be, we're not experiencing what we should be experiencing, we're not doing the very works that Jesus said we should, until we at least come to that conclusion and begin to get hungry and thirsty for it, we're never going to break through. We're going to go year after year with the same fruit, the same spiritual activity. Now, I love the end of this. The last verse in Mark, I think it's such a, an encouragement. And they went forth, it says. They, the disciples of Jesus, they went forth and preached everywhere. Look what it says. The Lord working with them. The Lord working with them. And confirming the word with signs following. The very signs that he said would follow, 
the healing, the tongues, the casting out of demons was the very works that Jesus demonstrated. Now, if you're an honest Bible student, you just read the book of Acts and you see that they went and preached. And some say, well, that was just for the apostles. Well, that just shows you how ignorant you are because you haven't read the whole book of Acts. Was Stephen an apostle? No. Was Philip an apostle? No, he was an evangelist. Was Ananias an apostle? No, we only see his name appear one time and he was the one that went and filled Paul with the Holy Ghost so he would speak with tongues. We know Paul spoke in tongues. Who filled him with the Spirit? Ananias. Ananias was just a simple disciple that's mentioned in, in one sentence and then not mentioned again. Stephen was an evangelist. He went out and did the miracles that, that, that the apostles did. Stephen was called upon as a deacon to wait tables, yet he goes out and does the exact same. What's the point? Anybody filled with the Holy Ghost will do the exact same miracles, the exact same works that Jesus Christ did. Nowhere in the scripture is it taught any differently than that. The, the reason we're not walking in it, we're not experiencing it, is A, we've either excused it away, or B, we're just not hungry for it. I want to stir up your holy minds. I want to stir, stir up your hunger and stir up your, your, your vision to begin to see in the scripture that this is not a, a promise to apostles only. Listen to what Jesus said. These signs follow them that believe. Believers. They'll cast out demons. They'll heal the sick. They'll speak with tongues. I, I want to read to you another ch uh, verse just because every truth should be confirmed by at least two or three witnesses. John chapter 14. A very famous verse for many of us who are walking maybe with God a while. Look at verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, not he that's an apostle, not he that's a bishop or a pastor, not he that's even an evangelist, but he that believes on me, the, the works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Now, if you're, uh, if you're familiar with the book of John at all, you know that when Jesus referred to the works he did that testified that I'm of the Father, he was directly speaking of his miracles as the works that he did. He said, if you don't believe me, believe me for the very works sake. The works that I do testify that I'm of God. The works he did were in, in the context of what he said was, was the miracles. He performed miracles. That proved that he was from God. And he told the disciples that whoever believes on him would do the very same works. That's what he's talking about in Mark 16. And in fact, in Mark 16, he's more specific because he actually outlines what those works are. Casting out demons, healing the sick, and speaking with new tongues as the preaching of the gospel goes forth. It's up to us to get hungry. I, I know when, when we get to eternity, we're all going to wish that we were more hungry for God on the earth. We're all going to wish we did more, preached more, believed more, trusted more, acted more. I think it's time that we just get get into a frame of mind that God is ready to pour out his spirit. He's changed my prayer life. I, I used to pray often, Lord, use me. Lord, use me. Lord, use me. That was a prayer I prayed I don't know how many times in my life. The prayer shifted recently. It was as if the Lord corrected me and said, I'll use you when you're usable. And my prayer began, began to be, Lord, make me usable. Lord, make me usable. Because the second that we come into the right mindset, that we agree with God's word, if you try to intellectually rationalize this out, you aren't going to go anywhere with God. That's the problem. We've got too many fatheads sitting in offices trying to figure out what God really meant by what he said. I just believe God meant exactly what he said. The proof's in the pudding. If you read the whole New Testament, you see the same consistency. The preachers who are anointed of the Holy Ghost those, and believers, not just preachers, believers that went out with the right mindset that this world is going to hell and dying and they need to know Jesus and they need to meet somebody who's living in Christ and I'm going to be the manifestation to the world of who Jesus really is. They went out with that mindset. They saw the results that Jesus promised. They healed the sick. They casted out demons. They raised the dead in many cases. There were activities. Now the kingdom of God is not word. Paul said it's power. Power is what God promised that would come upon the church who believes. And Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Now, the only reason you would need the Holy Ghost to come upon you, and the only reason I would need the Holy Ghost to come upon me, is if I had as my goal to do the very work that Jesus did. Now, what was the work? I covered in the beginning. Jesus Christ, it says, came to save sinners. Jesus said it of himself, I did not come to call the righteous, I came to call sinners to repentance. 
I want to ask you an honest question. When's the last time you saw a sinner come to repentance through your activity? I'm not talking about you were somewhere and saw a sinner repent. When is the last time that you individually, specifically, saw a sinner repent right before your eyes? I can tell you there's nothing more precious than that to see. And I mean a, a, a sinner, a sinner who, I'm not just talking about somebody who says, I'm going to try harder, I'm going to do better, I'm going to be a better person. I mean somebody that is against God's ways, living in rebellion and sin, who by your speaking recognizes I am a lost sinner on my way to hell eternally. And they come to that conclusion and the light bulb goes on and they crush and they break and they cry out to God in repentance. You know what the Bible says? Heaven rejoices over one sinner who comes to repentance. More than over 99 righteous people. More than 99 righteous people who are maybe sitting in a room together singing worship to God. That's great. I'm sure that God inhabits the praises of his people. But more than that, heaven, the only passage of scripture that says heaven rejoices is in the subject of re sinners coming to repentance because that is the actual work that Jesus Christ began, calling sinners to repent. The time is fulfilled. The time is at hand. When Jesus came to earth, he said, the time has come. The time is now. The gospel is here. The kingdom is preached. Repent, therefore. The time is here. Repent. That's the message of Christ. He was calling sinners to repent. When is the last time that you actually saw a sinner come to repentance? And if you say it's been a while or maybe never, I don't want to condemn you. I'm, I'm, I'm here to encourage you. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not at a pulpit in a church here. I'm sitting in my office. I'm calling you, I'm calling you out with love in my heart, with, with fervor, with passion, with, I mean, with everything that's in me. We have got to get back to what Christ came to do, call sinners to repentance and to expect when we go to do that part of the, the, the Great Commission, that we could expect the Lord to work with us. I love Mark 16, 20. The Lord worked with them. In other words, they weren't doing it alone. I think sometimes we think, well, we got to go witness more. We got to go do this more. We got to go do that more. That, that's great. Preach more. Pray more. Read your Bible more. That's all great. Fast more. But that's not the, the, the whole idea. The whole idea is abide in me, Jesus said, and I in you. For the branch can do nothing without the vine. Even so, you can do nothing without me. Without me, you can do nothing. But he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask whatever you want and it's done for you. If you were to go on reading John 14, remember he said, the works I did, you shall do also and greater works than these. The very next thing he says, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. God wants you full of his son, full of his life, to go out and act upon the word of God by faith to get results so that God gets the glory. God's not holding back miracles. God's not holding back his power. God's not stingy. He commanded us to go in power. He commanded us to go and heal. He commanded us to go and deliver. Therefore, it is his will to accomplish that work through us. But we have to believe it. We have to act upon it. And look what he says in the next verse. This is, this is John 14, 14. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, this is, this is exciting times where we can act, act upon the word of God by faith and every time expect the results that God promised. Now, it's all wrapped up though in this one great commission that we are to go to preach to a dead world, but not just to preach information, but to demonstrate the very resurrected life of Jesus, which is in us. We've got to get our spiritual lives right. We are du reduplicating Jesus Christ. In other words, when people see us, they're seeing Jesus Christ. That is to say, we have to be in Christ and Christ has to be in us. We have to be in right fellowship, in right mind, in right thinking, in right believing, and in right acting. And then the very works that Jesus did, we're going to do. I believe it's time we stop playing games. I believe it's time we stop playing church. Let's get hungry. Let's get serious. Let's get thirsty. Let's get to a place where we're not going to spend another year doing what we did last year. Let's get to a place where we're not going to accept fruitlessness. Because I believe with all my energy, I've been speaking with my brother Heldon in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. We're, we're agreeing in God that it's time for revival. I'm agreeing in God right now that it is time for the Spirit of God to be poured out in America. 
all God's looking for. Don't say use me. Say, God, make me usable. Bring me into a right mindset, a right hunger, a right process of thinking scripturally that I no longer am content doing something less than what Jesus commanded me to do. And and get our spiritual lives where they need to be so that when we go out, we're going out with Christ, not ahead of Christ, not behind Christ. And, And it'll be just like it says in Mark 16, 20. And the Lord worked with them. Your fruit will be so great when the Lord is working with you. If you're thinking, I wonder if this is God's will, just stop it and get your mind into a frame of mind. I need to abide in the Lord Jesus Christ. I need to spend days in the presence of, I need to be with him every day. It's not something we turn a switch on during ministry and then turn it off when we're done. It's daily abiding in the personhood of Jesus Christ so that when we go preach, he's preaching through us. When we go lay our hands, it's Christ coming through. We need to get in unity with Jesus. Abide in me, Jesus said. Abide in me. Remain in me. Get connected. Get your mind right. Are you doing the works of Jesus? Are you seeing sinners come to repentance? I believe it should be a regular affair in our life to see sinners come to repentance because our labors should be after the very thing Jesus began, which is calling sinners to repentance. Let's not accept anything less than that. I'm going to stop for tonight. Tonight. Uh, because I think I'm opening up way too many cans without letting it sink in. But I'm going to come back again very soon. And from here forward, I'm going to be doing my best to incite faith within you that we can believe together in all that the Word promises. You know what the, the world needs to see? The world needs to see a fresh baptism in the Holy Spirit. They need to see a manifestation of what the Bible says. We've talked long enough, but what makes you right and somebody else wrong? Because you know more than they know. Paul said, I'm going to come to you soon, to the church, he said. And there was some saying they were more apostles than than Paul was. Paul said, you know, I hear these guys, they're puffed up. But I'm going to know if they're the real deal. Not by the words that they speak, but by their power. For the kingdom of God is not word, it's power. If all we have is better words than the next guy, it's not enough. God didn't ever intend for Christianity to be a list of doctrines that we argue God intended Christianity to be a demonstration of power that the world would see the the, the actual resurrected life of Jesus coming through our physical bodies. We are the hands, the feet, the eyes of Jesus. Whatever Jesus did on the earth, he wants to continue to do. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and for he hasn't changed his ministry. He hasn't changed his tactics. He's still doing the exact same thing. What he lacks is yielded vessels who are abiding in him daily that can live in him and through him. For in him we live and move and have our being, it says in Acts 17, 28. We live in him and move in him and have our existence in him. It's not something we turn on and turn off. The world is trying to bog you down, load you down, weight you down, confuse you, distract you, cause you to get fearful. The word of God's trying to get you to get full of faith, full of hope, full of love, full of truth, full of passion, full of hunger, full of thirst. Who's going to win? Is the word of God going to accomplish in you what it intends to do? Or is the world going to continue to weight you down, making you think it's all about making money, all about enjoying your life? It's, it's not about any of that stuff. It's about Jesus Christ, him crucified and resurrected, even now sitting at the right hand of God. We are giving that away, but we've got to get our spiritual man right. We've got to get hungry and thirsty. Let's do it in Jesus' name. I love you guys. We'll reconvene here shortly. Peace.